Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secure retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in. Because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. I'm the Big Mike. Mike Zlatnik. And today it is my pleasure and a privilege to welcome back my really, really good friend, Bill Fairman. Hi, Billy. Hey, Mikey. How are you, my friend? So good to see you. Great to see you, too. Uh, we just came back from an event, Freedom Founders event. It was an awesome event. We saw each other there, and now we're recording this podcast. Billy, just for the audience, a couple of quick words about you. Uh, tell a little bit about Carolina Capital and uh, just a few. What's what, what's going on? What's the latest and greatest in the world of uh, sure. Bill Fairman? Um, yeah, and th thanks for asking. We are a uh, short-term lender, so private money, hard hard money lender. Where we concentrate on short-term loans with a construction component. Uh, we like to try to stay in the single family arena. So about 60% of our loans are going to be single family homes. The rest are going to be small apartment complexes and small self storage for uh, value add acquisition and value add loans. And we try to stay in the Southeast. We want to be in, you know, feet on the ground kind of in our market. Uh, we're not, not a huge company, but uh, uh, you know, the, the market's been really kind to, everyone in the real estate business right now let's uh let, let's hope that that continues <laughs> yeah yeah i hear you even as a lender you still benefit from the market that's yeah. growing in the value because it's lowering the risk for the loans even though you're not taking advantage of the upside you're not an equity investor but still your investment is just inherently safer as the values increase yeah as a, you know there's pros and cons to owning and and lending uh, you know, the cons are that you don't get to take advantage of the appreciation. Uh, you don't get the tax benefits that you typically get when you're owning a property. At the same time, you're typically in a deal for much less than the value because you're lending on it. And you control the asset without being responsible for that asset. Uh, so you still, you're still able to get passive income from it. Uh, you just don't happen to own and have the, um, responsibilities of ownership in the lending position yeah that's that's a great point it's a great refresher for folks the other thing that i'll i'll, I'll add is that uh it's really uh almost ideal product to invest in in mortgages and, and notes for ira investors because of um typically the debt has no risk of you bit so from that perspective it's uh it's a better product uh well, but i, I agree well, with you Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, uh, and, and you're not getting any tax benefits uh, anyway, so you might as well use a tax deferred or tax exempt account if you're going to invest in, in lending. That's right. So uh, IRAs, they couldn't care less about depreciation. So having tax benefits, uh, great for um, not IRA money, but it, it does very little for IRAs. That's a great point. Yeah. Uh, the other really interesting benefit is what you said is that sometimes loans is really an option to buy. So if the borrower defaults, which you hope you don't, you'll be happy to, to get paid in full, but if they default and your loan to value ratio is healthy, you can foreclose and get a property at a discounted price. It's like an option to buy at a discount. So from that perspective, it's a very powerful strategy and uh, folks can obviously use that in combination with equity investing. So well, go ahead, Bill, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, as as the banking side of things, you're not doing it because you want to own the property. But in the end, worst case scenario, you can own the property. Um, but we're we're in the banking side of things because we don't want to own the property. <laughs> Understood and agreed. But let me ask you this question. So in today's day and age, and we're recording this in late February 2022, there are massive supply chain issues uh, out there. Construction materials are hard to get, or if you get them, you order one thing, you get something else, you get a call, well, can't deliver it for the next eight weeks or however long. Um, how are your borrowers managing these type of uh, delays? And is it impacting duration of your loans, the payback on your loans? I'm just curious if you're having any, you know, any issues or you hear anything interesting. Well, it is, and we have 
really extended, uh, uh, we used to do a lot of six month loans and we have extended those now to more of an eight month term uh, to give them a, a little bit of leeway. Uh, otherwise, it, it benefits us as a lender if it goes past maturity because there's uh, extension fees that uh, are due the lender. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to burden your borrower with excess fees. Uh, so uh, going into this year, we've encouraged our borrowers to take the longer term. It's not costing them any more or less. Uh, they can still pay it off early if they want to, which is you know a great benefit to us because we get to take that money and turn it around and make more money with it. Uh, but it keeps them from having to pay additional extension fees. Not all of them take that advice, but you know, we do what we can. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, during, during COVID where we had to, um, we, we didn't know this was coming up, but we, we modified, uh, a few loans to make sure that we all are able to pull ourselves over the finish line as it were. And that, that's one of the benefits of doing business with a private lender. We have the capacity to make changes uh, uh, when they occur. Not a, a lot of your bigger banks, they don't, they, don't, they don't have the bandwidth to do that. It, it either works out the way it's on paper or it has to go to a different department. So they don't know how to handle that stuff. Smaller lenders yeah. like us, private lenders, we can, we can turn the ship fairly quickly. The bigger ones can't. That's right. Yeah, for sure. If the moment the loan is non-performing with a bank or there's some kind of delay or past maturity, it goes into a different department and different people and different operating procedures. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's it's hard. Not even, by the way, not even banks, sometimes even big hard money lenders. Sure. They, um, yeah, that, the, the whole departments that deal with, you know, asset mitigation, you know, loss mitigation or, 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 or asset management. But with the small it's shops, really... it's a lot easier, a lot, a lot more nimble to uh, it, it, work out a solution. It's really not their fault. Um, a, a lot of these guys are now, is, even with your private, uh, we'll call them private slash hard money lenders, uh, they're, they're securitizing these loans too and selling them on Wall Street. And once you have to modify something that's been securitized and then sold in the open market, there's a you have to buy that loan back. You have to replace it with something else. Then you can modify it. Then you can turn around and then sell it back to them. So it's, it's a real pain. And yeah, so the uh, that's actually are, the harder it point. is to do that. That's a great point. A lot of lenders have done this. They originated and sold, and then the people who bought it, they packaged it into something bigger and sold it to the Wall Street. And before you know, it's the good old days of um, 2008 and nine when well, when they had CDOs and other uh, complex um, derivatives. So the actual originator has no control over the decision power of the product because they sold it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a great point, uh, and that's that's a problem when you're working with big with big uh, organizations because you, the the people who originate you the loan have no power to modify it, and your little change and they can't do anything. Uh, so that's that's why folks work with you. But let's go back to the pricing on these loans. What what's a typical pricing uh, that rates have come down, have come up? Now the interest rates are climbing up little by little. Obviously, we're talking about very different rates. The the the, the short term rates that the Fed controls for intra banking lending rate is very different from the hard money rates. But what what are you seeing out there? Sure. Well, as rates uh, got more competitive over time in this space, or you know. When we started in business, we were getting 15% and, you know, three or four points uh, origination. That was uh, back in 2011 and, and 12. And, um, you know, that, that's high. But when you look at it realistically, if, if you're paying a 12% annualized interest rate uh, and you only have a six month loan, you pay six payments, you've really only paid 6% interest. So you have to keep that in perspective. It's the points that really uh, cost you the money. That That's how money is really made in, in the private uh, side. Now, don't get me wrong, the interest payments are also good, uh, but when it started getting more competitive, when you had the larger financial institutions getting into the space, well, it put pressure on most of the smaller people to you know, kind of conform and 
pricing pressure. So uh, over time, our points had moved down into the two and a half, three, three and a half, depending on, um, we're all risk managers. So depending on the risk of the deal, is how, how you price it out. But the interest rate remained in the uh, nine to 10 and a half percent range, uh, which is still uh, very competitive for um, hard money. There's, you know, again, bigger companies that are out there that are charging eight, nine, uh, typically they're uh, West Coast, or we'll say the coastal companies, uh, their loan amounts are much larger. Uh, I'm, I am not racing to the bottom because I know the other side of that. When you have to take properties back, you have to go through foreclosure. It, you're really losing money when you're having to do a foreclosure, especially in a state that takes a long time to uh, go through the foreclosure process. But the entire time this is happening and you're not getting paid, that's money that your investors are not earning. That's money that's not in the pipeline earning an income. And that's the most important thing is to try and get that money back as quick as possible so you can get it back in and earning. So what we did over that time period is that we were able to gain some relationships with some of those larger players who were smart enough that they did not want to go into these other markets where they aren't familiar with. They would rather partner with other companies that are already there and know the markets. And uh, we would uh, essentially, I want to call it leveraging, but it's not truly a leverage because we would sell a percentage of our loans to these companies. And in turn, they're able to provide us with a lower cost of capital. And at the same time, uh, we are able to arbitrage the difference between what we charge and what they're charging us. And that in turn raises the return that our investors in the fund are making. We're able to do a lot more loans with fewer dollars in our in capital that we have. Give me an example. So you would originate a loan at 10 and a half percent and you would sell what 90% of a loan to yeah, so a uh, one of these companies at 8% rate or something like that. Yes. And, and then we would, we would still service them. So we maintain the relationship and then we get to keep the spread between the, the eight and the, and the 10 and a half. And so that spread goes directly to the investor's pocket. And so then we're able to take that new capital that they just, they just gave us 80% of the loan. We take that new capital, we go out and make another loan with. So, uh, I, I'll give you this example. We have, uh, little over 16 million in our fund and we're uh, currently we have 48 million in active loans. And so that allows us to make many more loans than we normally would would be able to with that amount of capital and it's raising the yields that our investors are uh, receiving and at the same time they're more diversified because now they're in you know 400 500 loans versus you know 150 to 175 so they're much more diversified. So it's a great point. That's very, very fascinating uh, way to put it. You have 16 million and then you have 40, I guess you've got uh, three times uh, as much uh, AUM as you have kind of capital. But right. uh, what uh, is your position in these loans, the remaining position, subordinate to the folks that are buy or they're peri pursuit to what? They're all peri pursuit. The you way still we have skin up. in the game, but you're peri pursuit yes. to the other folks. Yeah, so we're equal with them. And then um, at, at, at the same time, again, it's not leverage. They own the loan, they're assigned that loan. So this, this was the other problem that I had in the past with getting a line of credit for uh, organizations like ourselves. Uh, we know that the Wall Street folks eventually find another shiny object or you have a downturn in the market and they want to get out of that space quickly and they call your note due, so to speak, and you have a certain amount of time to pay all that back, which is very difficult because they're all out in loans. <laughs> so uh, since they those loans are assigned to them and they own that piece of the loan, they have to wait for that loan to mature. So even if they decided to get out of that space, there's no pressure on us because they still have to wait for that loan to mature because it's their loan. 
Yeah, it's a much better setup. I, I concur. Instead of a collateralized line, which can be called any day of the week, the bank yep. feels like they, they, they don't want to do this business anymore versus you sell them the paper. They have to be in the life of that loan, however long it takes. And there's the default. They share the default with you. You keep whatever percent. So what is percentage typically that you keep? 20% of each loan? Well, it depends on the, it depends on the deals. Uh, if they're a little bit more out of the we'll call it the box. If it's a little outside of their comfort level, we'll take a little bit more back because we know the products, we know the areas, we um, uh, have confidence that it'll work or we wouldn't do the deal in the first place. So it, it typically ranges from between uh, 20 and uh, 10% that we'll have skin in the game. Makes sense. And I really like the fact that you are peer pursued to them. They're not senior to you. You don't have a second piece. You have a equal uh, right. uh, piece, which is a massive difference. Otherwise, you'd be effectively in a second position with right. a lot of risk versus you're in the same level of risk. You didn't move the risk at all, but you just created a, a rate of arbitrage that your fund is earning between what you pay for their money versus what your investors paying you. So it's a brilliant idea. Great job. Well, it was, thank you. And, and it was, uh, we were able to negotiate, negotiate that more because we're dealing with insurance companies versus financial institutions. Now, while an insurance company is still a financial institution, they're not banking, they're not bankers. And, and there's nothing wrong with the way that we're doing it. And we're not trying to get over on anyone. It's just that Typically with a financial institution, banking type of financial institution, we've always done it this way and this is the way we're going to continue to do it. At least when you're dealing with insurance companies, they are a little bit more open minded. They, uh, again, they like the space. We're, we're not, by no means are we a large part of their uh, particular portfolio. Uh, you know, they're trying to get higher yield, so they're taking smaller chunks of their portfolio and piecing it out there and what they consider a, a much higher risk than they normally would because insurance companies are typically pretty conservative in their investing, but uh, they too are not getting a return in the typical conservative investing arena. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the gonna... biggest problem. Exactly what you said. The biggest problem with the whole life policies uh, and all those policies with, with infinite banking and everything else, because they're paying you return your money. They're paying you, uh, I don't know what, what their benchmarks, but let's just say they're paying you five, five seventy five return on your money that you put in the policy. Obviously, they collect a bunch of fees, but in general, um, they got to get the capital deployed and they need to deploy it um, relatively safe because they have guaranteed contracts to their um, policyholders. And um, if they can't find yield, that's a problem for them. Mm -hmm. They can't they can't write new policies. And, and uh, that's the core business. So hard money lending uh, and, and number of other investments have uh, basically, they, they've ventured into these alternatives because they don't have a choice. They can't find yield anywhere right. else. So that's exactly uh, what you said. Um, you see a lot of, I was gonna say, you see a lot of uh, uh, state pension plans, guaranteed uh, pensions, uh, they're, they're suffering too. They're trying to find uh, higher yield items because they have a guaranteed uh, payoff that they have for these pension funds and they're not receiving it in the typical conservative arena either. Um, a lot of them are doing junk bonds and stuff I wouldn't uh, mess with, but even your junk bonds are paying four and five percent. <laughs> so it's really interesting. We're working on a couple of upcoming projects and um... The uh, it's a multifamily deal, so large multifamily uh, syndications that we'll bring into the market. Um, phenomenal deals, and um, the first lien paper, the mortgage money, is not coming from banks. It's coming from a large insurance company, at least in a couple of them. And it makes total sense. It's a, it's a very conservative investment for them. First lien mortgage on a strong value at multifamily is 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 very low risk to the banks. They're getting better yield on those deals than they would uh, doing whatever placements and whatever bonds that they they could. So they like the product. They like firstly the mortgage uh, on you know multifamily assets as well as obviously um, fix and flip uh, projects. Um, so they can probably offer you better capital cost type of dollars 
uh, than um, lines of credit and banks could, and they're giving you also um, less restrictive terms. So it's a win-win both ways. You're helping them deploy the capital. On the other side, you are um, benefiting your investors in the fund. So yeah, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, well, I was going to say the, the main thing that uh, because business has been uh, so good thanks to the market. Now, keeping in mind on the multi, I'm sorry, the single family stuff, it's very difficult to find inventory. So we're doing a, a, a lot more, and we'll we'll call it more risky loans because there's more parts that are moving because they are con new construction versus just taking something that's um, needs a little fixing up. And now we're adding a another layer of risk because it's going to take longer. Uh, you know, you have permitting issues, labor issues, all that stuff, you know, just multiplies when you start doing new construction. Uh, but you're, you're, you know, finding um, an inventory issue out there, not with just supplies, but with the, with the homes themselves, because there's a shortage out there. Um, that said, uh, that's why we moved into the smaller multifamily and self storage. They're still uh, re residential. Everybody needs a place to live. Um, and then for some reason, as Americans, we can't get rid of our stuff. So we also have to have storage. <laughs> we, we, we have a, a, a not very comfortable side of us that says we get too attached to our stuff and you don't want to get rid of it. You have to store it someplace because you never know when you might need it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got a couple of obviously good uh, comments on this. And one is uh, one man's treasure is not, well, one, one man's uh, junk is another man's treasure or vice versa. So the storage um, facilities have picked up demand as a result of COVID. That's been, you know, really hot uh, demand driver for, for storage. So in agreement, and it sounds like you're doing some loans on some storage facilities, which uh, makes total sense as, as the, the asset themselves continue to do well, should the, should the loans. Um, and, and as a small provider, we have to, we have to be careful. We, we can't make the larger loans. We have to make them, we, we have to make the smaller ones. And so the, the benefit to us is the, because they're small, I, I'm not competing with larger companies to get those loans. They don't want to mess with them. And so it, it's a perfect niche for us anyway. Uh, it's just our portfolio has changed a little bit when it used to be more, you know, 85 to 90% single family. Now it's kind of a 60, 40 split. But again, that's the benefit of being small. You're able to, um, you know, get take what the market gives you and make those adjustments versus having to react. Uh, you're able to go ahead and make those changes with uh, not too much of an issue. So congratulations for being nimble. Um, being a capital allocator myself, uh, I certainly appreciate the market changes and uh, moving with the opportunities. Uh, it sounds like you've you've realized where the demand is and you've shifted uh, within the framework of the fund that, that, that you're mm -hmm. doing. If you're shifted into the opportunities that continue to provide great economics and um, provide you with the deal flow without taking uh, too much risk. So very quickly, how much do you have in the new construction loans? I'm just curious how much business is being driven by new construction versus kind of existing and some small commercial. Yeah. So the uh, new construction is about 18 to 20%, um, you know, depending on, on the time of the year. Uh, it, I mean, it's not a huge amount of our single family. I tell you we, what we have more now than, the fix and flip is this still in the single family, but more people are um, acquiring homes that they want to hold on to rent. So we're still doing, uh, you know, the, the fixing and the uh, acquisition part, but instead of selling them, they're, they're turning around and refinancing them and, and holding them long term. So we're, we're seeing a lot more of that as well, which is still good. It's still single family and it's still affordable housing. Uh, and that's kind of what we're looking for. So that's worked out really well. And it makes then, sense, but on a long-term basis, they can't pay, it's too expensive to pay, you know, 9, 10, 11% rates. Yeah, yeah, uh, but there, that's what I mean. Instead of the sale, they're refinancing them to a long-term. As uh, soon as they get ready to occupy, they just refinance them to a long-term loans. 
Yeah, it's the uh, buy, fix, and refi method, which is yep. yeah. I mean, that's that's sort of has been used in single family for a long time, and it is used also in multifamily. It's a classic example. A lot of projects, including small ones, if you want to reach stabilization, even mm -hmm. on your value of storage facility, get to the point where the bank will write a check. Of course, I mean that's that's the ultimate goal of most of these investors is not to um, keep your money for too long. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> well, you know, for your listeners, um, yes, there are uh, inventory issues. Part of the problem is you got your your big hedge funds that are buying up all the single family, your open doors and all that are pushing out a lot of the realtors as well. Uh, but there's always opportunity. I mean, there's stumbling blocks for, for the folks that are smaller. Uh, the opportunity is trying to figure out, figure out what it is that those hedge funds are looking for. And then you look for the stuff they're not looking for. And there's not nearly as much competition in there. So as much as people are stressing about, you know, the obstacles, uh, try to find the opportunities in those obstacles and then go after those outside opportunities that they're not interested in. They don't like to be in the little tertiary market. So go outside of the uh, major markets or even the median markets. You can go out in the suburbs a little bit. And at the same time, you, you can buy the older homes. Is there a little bit more risk in the older homes if you're doing fix and flip that you're going to have to spend a little bit more money and fixing them up? Sure. Uh, but again, you're going to be you know, working in an area that there's not a lot of competition, just like our friend uh, Glenn Stromberg does. He's focused in on the manufactured homes where there's zero competition for them from the hedge funds. So uh, just trying to find that niche that uh, the big companies are kind of forgetting and you should do fine, right? Yeah, it's be on the radar screen of the of the big players to, to, to whatever uh, opportunities you could find, great opportunities. You obviously need to find, you, you don't want to get away from very lucrative deals because it's competition <laughs> um, and get into secondary deals. But the fact is uh, that there are plenty of uh, niche opportunities. Um, I, I like I like uh, this concept: uh, the riches in the niches. I don't know if, you, if it's if it's if it rhymes, but you could find substantial uh, great opportunities in in the on on you know unwalked path, uh, right. or at least not a path where. The million pound gorillas from the Wall Street is is just driving everybody out of that path. So I mean that 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 happened in the hard money space and it continues to happen. And um, the the smaller market is just difficult for the big players to come in because they don't, they can't get the economy of scale. So yes. there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the smaller markets. The the other strategy that folks have used, uh, besides staying away from the from the million pound gorillas, uh, is um, be ahead of them. So if you know, they know they're going to come, you, you may be able to do something in, in a certain area or business and then sell it to them. That's kind of right. been, especially if they're buying and you 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 want to buy and then sell, buying in the path of progress of path of big money, then you'll probably get outsized return because when that money comes in chasing deals, it's going to pay top dollar. But for, you, for, for the for lending side, it's a little different because you're not owning the property. So you need to find areas where the, the big players just don't want to operate the markets are too small for them so any final thoughts any wisdom book whatever you want to share final and, and how would folks get a hold of you uh if they're interested to uh work with you and, sure. and so on thank you um yeah so our website is carolinahardmoney.com and if you're interested in uh investing perhaps uh, on the mortgage side as a passive investor, just click on the accredited investor tab. Uh, you can contact uh, any of us, uh, any of our team through that same website, carolinahardmoney.com. Um, one thing you just touched on is um, not competing with the bigger players, but working with them. And that's kind of what we did with our lending is that instead of trying to beat our heads against the uh, wall there and try to compete with them uh, rate wise, we just leveraged their resources and worked with them. And that's helped us out quite a bit. At the same time, you have to be careful. 
And if you're buying properties up to sell to these companies, um, don't do your entire business model around these companies, because like we, we said earlier in the show, they will find another shiny object or move away quicker than you can believe. And then you're held, you're, you're stuck there holding either properties or, or loans you can't uh, finish out. So uh, just be careful. Um, don't make that your whole business model, but certainly take advantage of it uh, why, why you can. That, that's my tidbit of wisdom. Yeah, you're, you're not making your long-term friends, you're making temporary allies while yep. uh, it benefits them uh, and it benefits you. You can work together until the time where they change their strategy and they, they, they do something else and they no longer need your services per se. So that, I was going to mention that, that you know, during COVID, there's a lot of companies that do what we do that turned around and made their whole business model of doing nothing but originating loans for these larger companies. They had none of their own funds and they would just either sell them one off or they just had a big enough line of credit where they could make 30 days worth of loans and then sell it to them. And then when COVID hit and they just cut off all the, you know, shut that tap off because they didn't know what they were going to do. All those people were out of business. They could no longer make any new loans and they had nothing to fall back on. So just, yeah. just be careful. Great, great wisdom. And I wanted to reflect, we just came again from Freedom Founders event and they had a great subject, Anti-Fragile, uh, the book by Nassim Taleb. I read the book. It's a phenomenal book. And what you just mentioned, an example of somebody, somebody being extremely fragile. If they have a business that relies on one source of capital and that source of capital uh, uh, stops working, they're fragile. They're broke. That's it. They're done. And uh, having many sources and many options uh, can make your business anti-fragile or a lot more flexible. You're not uh, dependent on just one source of revenue and one source of deal flow, one source of more money. So building a business with uh, flexibility to adjust to market conditions is a critical piece of anti-fragile. So <laughs> uh, it just fresh in my mind. I wanted to mention this because yes. it's a very powerful concept. And it, and uh, you build, build your business in an anti-fragile manner, you can uh, adjust um, to the market and that, that's the strength of the, uh, of the system, so. And, and then something else that, uh, real quick, I know uh, we gotta go, but um, one of the things that stuck out to me from that meeting was your focus. And you still need to take a piece of paper and put down all the obstacles that may be coming up. And then you put down what are all your opportunities. But be careful that you don't continuously focus on the, uh, you know, the objects that are in your path. Those obstacles, if you focus on those obstacles, you're always going to have obstacles. Put most of your focus on the opportunities around the obstacles and uh, your, your, that mental capacity to get around those obstacles are going to be a lot clearer. If you have a, you watch the professional golfers they'll a lot of times they'll sit there and close their eyes before they make a shot to try and visualize what that shot's going to do or how they want to make that shot happen. It's the same thing with finding those opportunities. You want to visualize the opportunity piece, not the obstacle that's in your way. Yeah, great wisdom. Thank you for sharing this focus on the opportunities versus the obstacles or difficulties. And yep. um, yeah, I mean, the path of progress is always seeing opportunity in every difficulty or how to go around the difficulty or an obstacle and find a way forward. That's that's why focusing on the opportunities is much better than focusing on the problems. Uh, and it's also one is a very um, creative kind of energizing path versus the other one is it's more of a fighting the resistance and you, you fighting the resistance is all, always hard versus sure. moving ahead, being the leader of the pack or finding a way where there is no immediate obvious way. It's always more fun. So yeah. Billy, thank you very much for your wisdom. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Appreciate you. And um, uh, website once again, carolinahardmoney.com, right? Yes, sir. Thank you kindly. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. It was awesome. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to BigMikeFun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike's slot name. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style.
See you on the next episode.